Hi, ESL 3-4. So we are actually almost done with this book, with The Alchemist. So we're getting really close to Santiago reaching the pyramid. So last time we picked up um, with the book, he was two days from the pyramid, and he's still traveling with The Alchemist. So I'm going to go ahead and keep reading. Please follow along with me on your PDFs. If we're going to go our separate ways soon, the boy said, then teach me about alchemy. You already know about alchemy. It is about penetrating to the soul of the world and discovering the treasure that has been reserved for you. No, that's not what I mean. I'm talking about transforming lead into gold. The alchemist fell as silent as the desert and answered the boy only after they stopped to eat. Everything in the universe has evolved, and for wise men, gold is the metal that evolved the furthest. Don't ask me why. I don't know why. I just know that tr the tradition is always right. Men have never understood the words of the wise, so gold, instead of being seen as a symbol of evolution, became the basis for conflict. There are many languages spoken by things, the boy said. There was a time when, for me, a camel's whinnying was nothing more than whinnying. Then it became a, single of, a signal of danger, and finally it became just a whinny again. But then he stopped. The alchemist probably already knew all that. I have known true alchemists, the alchemist continued. They locked themselves in their laboratories and tried to evolve, as gold had. And they found the philosopher's stone because they understood that, every, that when something evolves, everything around that thing evolves as well. Others stumbled upon the stone by accident. They already had the gift, and their souls were readier for such things than the souls of others. But they don't count. They're quite rare. And then there are the others, who were interested only in gold. They never found the secret. They forgot that lead, copper, and iron have their own personal legends to fulfill, and anyone who interferes with the personal legend of another thing never will discover his own. The alchemist's words echoed out like a curse. He reached over and picked up a shell from the ground. This desert was once a sea, he said. I noticed that, the boy answered. The alchemist told the boy to place the shell over his ear. He had done that many times when he was a child and had heard the sound of the sea. The sea has lived on in this shell because it, that's its personal legend, and it will never cease doing so until the desert is once again covered by water. They mounted their horses and rode out in the direction of the pyramids of Egypt. The sun was setting when the boy's heart sounded a danger signal. They were surrounded by giant dunes, and the boy looked at the alchemist to see whether he had sensed anything. But he appeared to be unaware of any danger. Five minutes later, the boy saw two horsemen waiting ahead of them. Before he could say anything to the alchemist, the two horsemen had become ten, and then a hundred, and when they were everywhere in the dunes. They were tribesmen dressed in blue with black rings surrounding their turbans. Their faces were hidden behind blue veils with only their eyes showing. Even from a distance their eyes conveyed the strength of their souls, and their eyes spoke of death. Oh no. Okay, let's continue on. The two were taken to a nearby military camp. A soldier shoved the boy and the alchemist into a tent where the chief was holding a meeting with his staff. These are the spies, said one of the men. We're just travelers, the alchemist answered. You were seen at the enemy camp three days ago, and you were talking with one of the troops there. I'm just a man who wanders the desert and knows the stars, said the alchemist. I have no information about troops or about the movement of the tribes. I was simply acting as a guide for my friend here. Who is your friend? the chief asked. An alchemist, the, uh, said the alchemist. He understands the forces of nature, and he wants to show you his extraordinary powers. The boy listened quietly and fearfully. What is a foreigner doing here? asked another of the men. He has brought money to give to your tribe, said the alchemist. Before the boy could say a word, and seizing the boy's bag, the alchemist gave the gold coins to the chief. The Arab accepted them without a word. There was enough there to buy a lot of weapons. What is an alchemist? he asked finally. It's a man who understands nature and the world. If he wanted to, he could destroy this camp with just the force of the wind. The men laughed. They were used to the ravages of war and knew that the wind could not deliver them a fatal blow. Yet each felt his heart beat a little faster. They were men of the desert, and they were fearful of sorcerers. 
"'I want to see him do it,' said the chief. "'He needs three days,' answered the alchemist. "'He is going to transform himself into the wind, "'just to demonstrate his powers. "'If he can't do so, we humbly offer you our lives, "'for the honor of your tribe.' "'You can't offer me something that is already mine,' the chief said arrogantly. "'But he granted the travelers three days. "'The boy was shaking with fear, and the alchemist helped him out of the tent. "'Don't let them see that you're afraid,' the alchemist said. "'They are brave men, and they despise cowards.' "'But the boy couldn't even speak. "'He was able to do so only after they had walked through the center of the camp. "'There was no need to imprison them. "'The Arabs simply confiscated their horses.' So once again the world had demonstrated its many languages. The desert only moments ago had been endless and free, and now it was an impenetrable wall. "'You gave them everything I had,' the boy said, "'everything I've saved in my entire life. "'Well, what good would it be to you if you had to die? "'Your money saved us for three days. "'It's not often that money saves a person's life.' But the boy was too frightened to listen to words of wisdom. He had no idea he was how he was going to transform himself into the wind. He wasn't an alchemist. The alchemist asked one of the soldiers for some tea and poured some on the boy's wrists. A wave of relief washed over him, and the alchemist muttered some words the boy didn't understand. "'Don't give in to your fears,' said the alchemist in a strangely gentle voice. "'If you do, you won't be able to talk to your heart. "'But I have no idea how to turn myself into the wind.' If a person is living out of his personal legend, he knows everything he needs to know. There is only one thing that makes a dream impossible to achieve, the fear of failure. I'm not talking, I'm not afraid of failing, it's just that I don't know how to turn myself into the wind. Well, you'll have to learn, your life depends on it. But what if I can't? Then you'll die in the midst of trying to realize your personal legend. That's a lot better than dying like millions of people who never knew, even knew what their personal legends were. But don't worry, the alchemist continued. Usually the threat of death makes people a lot more aware of their lives. The first day passed and there was a major battle nearby, and a number of wounded were brought back to the camp. The dead soldiers were placed by, replaced by others, um, and life went on. Death doesn't change anything, the boy thought. You could have died later on, a boy said to the body of one of his companions. You could have died after peace had been declared, but in any case you were going to die. At the end of the day, the boy went looking for the alchemist, who had taken his falcon out into the desert. I still have no idea how to turn myself into the wind, the boy repeated. Remember what I told you. The world is only the visible aspect of God and that what alchemy does is bring spiritual perfection into contact with the material plane. What are you doing, feeling my falcon? If I'm not able to turn myself into the wind, we're going to die. Why feed your falcon? You're the one who may die, the alchemist said. I already know how to turn myself into the wind. On the second day, the boy climbed to the top of a cliff near the camp. The sentinels allowed him to go, and they had already heard about the sorcerer who could turn himself into the wind, and they didn't want to go near him. In any case, the desert was impassable. He spent the entire afternoon of the second day looking out over the desert and listening to his heart. The boy knew the desert sensed his fear. They both spoke the same language. On the third day, the chief met with his officers. He called the alchemist to the meeting and said, Let's go see the boy who turns himself into the wind. Let's, the alchemist answered. The boy took, the, took them to the cliff where he had been on the previous day. He told them all to be seated. It's going to take a while, the boy said. We're in no hurry, the chief answered. We are men of the desert. The boy looked out on at the horizon. There were mountains in the distance, and there were dunes, rocks, and plants that insisted on living where survival seemed impossible. There was the desert that he had wandered for so many months, despite all that time, he knew only a small part of it. Within that small part he had found an Englishman, caravans, tribal wars, and an oasis of fifty thousand palm trees and three hundred wells. "'What do you want here today?' the desert asked him. "'Didn't you spend enough time looking at me yesterday?' "'Somewhere you are holding the person I love,' the boy said. "'So when I look out over your sands, I am also looking at her. "'I want to return to her, and I need your help so that I can turn myself into the wind.' 
What is love? the desert asked. Love is the falcon's flight over your sands, because for him you are a green field from which he always returns with game. He knows your rocks, your dunes, and your mountains, and you are generous to him. The falcon's beak carries bits of me my, of me myself, the desert said. For years I care for his game, feeding it with the little water that I have, and then I show him where the game is. And one day, as I enjoy the fact that his game thrives on my surface, the falcon dives out of the sky and takes away what I've created. But that's why you created the game in the first place, the boy answered, to nourish the falcon. And the falcon then nourishes man. And eventually man will nourish your sands, where the game was will once again flourish. That's how the world goes. So is that what love is? Yes, that's what love is. It's what makes the game become the falcon, and the falcon become the man, and the man in turn the desert. It's what turns lead into gold and makes the gold return to the earth. I don't understand what you're talking about, the desert said. But you can at least understand that somewhere in your sands there is a woman waiting for me, and that's why I have to return. I have to turn myself into the wind. The desert didn't answer him for a few moments. Then it told him, I'll give you my sands to help the wind blow, but alone I can't do anything. You have to ask for help from the wind. A breeze began to blow. The tribesmen watched the boy from a distance, talking among themselves in a language that the boy couldn't understand. The alchemist smiled. The wind approached the boy and touched his face. It knew of the boy's talk with the desert, and because the winds know everything. They blow across the world without a birthplace and with no place to die. Help me, the boy said. One day you carried the voice of my loved one to me. Who taught you to speak the language of the desert and the wind? My heart, the boy answered. The wind has many names. In that part of the world it was called the Sirocco, because it brought moisture from the oceans to the east, and the distant land the boy came from they called the Leventer because they believed that it brought with it the sands of the desert and the screams of the Moorish wars. Perhaps in the places beyond the pastures where his sheep lived, men thought that the wind came from Andalusia. But actually the wind came from no place at all, nor did it go any place. That's why it was stronger than the desert. Someone might one day plant trees in the desert and even raise sheep here, but never would they harness the wind. You can't be the wind, the wind said. We're two very different things. That's not true, the boy said. I learned the alchemist's secrets in my travels. I have inside me the winds, the deserts, the oceans, and the stars, and everything created in the universe. We were all made by the same hand, and we all have the same soul. I want to be like you, able to reach every corner of the world, across the seas, blow away the sands that cover my treasure, and carry the voice of the woman I love. I heard what you were talking about the other day with the alchemist, the wind said. He said that everything has its own personal legend, but people can't turn themselves into the wind. Just teach me how to be the wind for a few moments, the boy said, so you and I can talk about the lim limitless possibilities of people and the winds. The wind's curiosity was aroused, something that had never happened before. It wanted to talk about those things, but it didn't know how to turn a man into the wind. And look how many things the wind already knew how to do. It created deserts, sank ships, felled entire forests, and blew through cities filled with music and strange noises. It felt that it had no limits. Yet, here was a boy saying that there were other things the wind should be able to do. This is what we call love, the boy said, seeing that the wind was close to granting what he requested. When you are loved, you can do anything in creation. When you are loved, there is no need at all to understand what's happening, because everything happens within you, and even men can turn themselves into the wind, as long as the wind helps, of course. The wind was, being pr uh, was a proud being, and it was becoming irritated with what the boy was saying. It commenced to blow harder, raising the desert sands, but finally it had to recognize that even making its way around the world, it didn't know how to turn a man into the wind and it knew nothing about love. In my travels around the world I've seen people speaking of love and looking towards the heavens, the wind said, furious at having to acknowledge its own limitations. Maybe it's better to ask heaven. 
"'Well, then help me to do that,' the boy said. "'Fill this place with a sandstorm so strong that it blots out the sun, "'and then I can look to heaven.'